Hello, hello, and welcome to Hot Take Think Tank. I'm Kier. And I'm Liam. And uh, Kier, this week in your article on Kier here, uh, lots of good thoughts in there, but one thing did stick out to me, which is that you mentioned uh, going into ritual trances uh, <laughs> at some point in your past. <laughs> yeah. I, I, had not, I had not heard about that before, so you gotta you got to tell me more. <laughs> okay, okay. So you're telling me you have not been in ritual trances? I, you know, I am familiar with but have not been in any like drug induced trances mm -hmm. uh but i i haven't even really heard about ritual induced trances so uh <laughs> that's what i gotta hear about okay okay like, like chanting or like i don't know hitting your head with the bible or something <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe for some people there's a Bible hitting involved, but uh, mm -hmm. no, my main exposure to ritual trance was uh, during my brief stint as a witch. Um, uh -huh. I was involved in the local we reclaiming witchcraft scene and um, uh -huh. reclaiming witchcraft is like something that was invented in, I think the like early eighties maybe in San Francisco <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's kind of spread from there and it's very, has a lot of overlap with social justice world. Okay. And, um, yeah, it is very interesting. Now, so. Yeah. Re Cause reclaiming <laughs> seems odd. Cause I don't, there weren't historical, which is from my understanding, that was like a made up thing to persecute people. Right. <laughs> I am very offended that you would oh, no. even I shouldn't say have that. Uh, no, um, actually, like, ultimately, that was one of the things that, like, uh, annoyed me the most about witchcraft mm. is that, like, there totally is this narrative that somehow we are, like, bringing back the pagan religion of right. Europe that mm. predated Christianity and, you know, that there's even like it's sort of implied that there's like this unbroken line of practice and that what we are uh, doing right. has like any commonality with what those people like hmm. thousands of years ago were doing. Um, that is that's sort of like the mythos of it. Um, and I I looked for a very long time to see if I could find like anything <laughs> that like supported that and it doesn't exist. Um, so right. yeah, it's, but that's, that's the idea, right? Like you're connecting with the elements, um, that have different types of significance. And, um, there's a lot of, uh, catharsis, um, which is mm -hmm. an aspect of a lot of the rituals, right? This idea that like having sort of like a peak, intense emotional experience and release um can be good for you and, and can do good things for you so right. i'll give you a specific example <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. i, I want to hear a ritual here <laughs> <laughs> the juicy stuff mm -hmm. so uh, uh Samhain is sort of the celtic holiday that eventually became halloween mm -hmm. and um it is a big probably the biggest celebration of the year for this local witch scene and probably other ones as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's about the veil being thin between the world. So it's a time for you to commune with your ancestors, uh, people who have passed, uh, time to kind of celebrate death and birth. And mm -hmm. so uh, it takes place, I think it still happens, I haven't gone in a while, but um, <laughs> in this big hall and the lights are really low and it's like really beautifully decorated inside, right? Like lots of electric mm -hmm. candles. I even think there were like, um, altars in every corner that related to the different elements. Um, cool. and I think that little, sounds cool. <laughs> it was, it's so beautiful, right? It's like very, like, it's very Halloween. Let's just put it that way. Right. <laughs> and so are the people arriving. Like a lot of people are, dressed in a lot of black or like robes or flowing things, um, lots of witch hats. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, people kind of come usually with like some pillows and blankets because most people are going to be sitting on the floor sort of in a circle. Mm -hmm. And there'll be like kind of a stage, a circular stage in the middle where like various activities will happen during the ritual. Um, so yeah, there's like a variety of different things, you know, there's a, a chance for everyone to 
um, contribute to names of people who have died that year that get spoken. Um, mm-hmm. Babies who have been born that year, their names are also spoken. So those are like really kind of moving moments to be in like this mm-hmm. large group of people and um, kind of hearing those names. Um but at some point there is a trance and the idea there is that you, um, I guess it's kind of similar to like a guided meditation, right? Right, Um, and someone like everyone will sort of close their eyes and be quiet. And then someone will kind of speak you through, um, a journey sort of, right. 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 Um, Where that might like activate your imagination, but it's not hmm. framed as an imagination. It's framed as like a, uh, the force is reaching out to you or something like that. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and they did for me for sure. Like I absolutely like had conversations with various people I know mm-hmm. that are no longer alive. Um, and yeah, it, it could be like really moving, right. To Yeah, totally. Yeah. Come face to face with uh, someone that you missed, for example. Um, and that's, that is really something that I experienced and it is like this interesting thing, right? Because I mean, I think there has to be a desire there, right? Like you're going to mm-hmm. bring up <laughs> something for yeah. for yourself. Um, but yeah, it can still, it can still be like really meaningful. Um, but it's also very strange, right? Like I think mm-hmm. a lot of people take the directives that they receive in that state, like pretty seriously, um, you know, follow the advice or whatever else is given. Um, Mm -hmm. and I think a lot of people do experience it not as, you know, sort of your imagination. Yeah. Yeah. Like a trick of the mind, but as like a, an actual connection with the afterlife sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Interesting. Is it? Yeah. That's in, that's very interesting because <laughs> I mean that that brings to mind like the um, I don't know sort of predatory uh, what do you call them people who say they can contact your loved ones who have passed oh yes like and mediums. like put words in their mouth and that sort of thing uh, mm-hmm. but it sounds like no one was putting <laughs> other than the people in the trances like it was uh it sort of <laughs> I don't know I in from my view, uh, you kind of got to decide what the person was telling you as opposed yeah. to a third party kind of. Yeah, totally. Like it, I think everyone who went probably had a pretty unique experience with it, including people that are like, nothing's happening. What's going on? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, there was a time where I found those types of experiences really meaningful and, um, oh. and even comforting sometimes. Um, but I don't know. It's weird because like when you realize that you can get yourself into such a state um, without any drugs or alcohol, because reclaiming spaces tend to be sober spaces, Mm. um, you can really start to like want that or crave that. Right. And, and yeah, experiences that like aren't that intense or extreme, like suddenly don't feel that meaningful anymore. Right. 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 Like I think of almost like an eye adjusting to a really bright light and then everything else seems uh, darker when you look away from it, sort of. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it's like, do I have to kind of get myself into that state on a regular basis to have a spiritual practice, right? Like, is it, mm-hmm. what if I'm like going through the motions, but I don't really feel it, right? Or like, yeah, it's, it's, I think it can cause this, um, I don't know, just, just this like desire for intensity and desire to like escape kind of your normal everyday life. Um, right. Totally. And I, yeah. I feel like, I don't know, in some ways <laughs> it's like the, a, a category of people I have a hard time getting my mind around is like the casual ghost believer because it's <laughs> okay, like, you have to explain that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like not <laughs> believing in ghosts and being casual about it seems sensible to me i put myself in that category (laughs) believing in ghosts and being obsessed with it also makes sense to me because it's like if you think that that's true like that's like an earth shattering sort of uh i don't know realization (laughs) whereas like believing in ghosts but just like mostly going on about your life 
is I can't I can't <laughs> that that's the one that like in my head it's like I don't it doesn't click the I don't know the the magnitude of that revelation with like oh yeah and then I don't know I watch ghost shows on TV. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny because I definitely like did have a number of su- supernatural experiences mm. that I I had. And then I don't know. I just like really haven't had any in a bunch of years. And it's not like I was like consciously wanting them before. But I'm like, oh, am I ever going to have them again? Or <laughs> or were they more reflective of me being like less mentally stable than I am now? <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> right. Have you really accidentally happen. put out that spark by <laughs> by doing things that otherwise uh, were good for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's um, I, yeah, I kind of realized that that that's like not for me. Like, I think there will be times where I experience like m- lots of joy and ecstasy in mm-hmm. in my future, but I think I you know I don't want it to be something to chase. And actually, that's yeah. also why I don't meditate is because <laughs> I've had some like interesting really kooky experiences while doing that. Um, maybe because I have done acid before. Uh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, as I was going to say, like I, I, I meditate every now and then and I would not describe it as kooky in any way. It's the most mind numbing, boring <laughs> thing I do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think it's like entirely unusual to have like strange sensory experiences while meditating oh, although oh, of oh. course not everybody does but um yeah i'm just like i don't know if this is for me <laughs> yeah. uh, the only time i get that is like why when i fall asleep while meditating the last like 30 seconds before i fall asleep it starts Ooh. getting like half dream half awake that's the weird part <laughs> Still trippy. Not too, just uh <laughs> just weird just uh, weird so you so you don't <laughs> do trances anymore uh which no. was a very small part of the article <laughs> the main <laughs> thrust of the article is uh that you don't search for purity anymore mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um which is also very interesting maybe in a more profound way mm. uh you sort of get into the idea that well i don't know that that sort of anything you wanted to associate yourself with had to meet some standard of purity of uh, you know that you talk about like looking at potential college majors and being like, well, it can't be history because, you know, mm-hmm. history is, uh, I don't know, all about the great men or something. And I can't do anthropology because they used to call people savages. And mm-hmm. uh, and then you end up just not going to college because there's <laughs> no, there's nothing left. <laughs> what do you pick if you're looking for something with like a perfect track record, right? Probably I mean, you tried and nothing is the answer. (laughs) Nothing, nothing. Yeah, totally. And like as an activist, like I did jump from organization to organization because like, you know, if I was there long enough, there would be some decision that was made that just felt like such um, betrayal of the original mission of the organization. And I just like couldn't tolerate that. Right. Like the idea of like compromise right or like being strategic or pragmatic like i just i couldn't tolerate that um and so and and i think that was like a level of purity i was holding myself to as well right trying to get my thoughts and my feelings and my behavior to also meet some like unachievable level of purity um but it took yeah. me a really long time to realize that that was kind of the common thread between like these different mm. areas of my life. Um, and just to realize like what an awful way to go through the world. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> it's a great way to feel bad all the time and also right. to be really ineffective because you're not willing to like stick it out and figure out what you right. can do right? right so don't don't engage the hard problems you like don't you don't even acknowledge the hard problems right it's not like a mm-hmm. question of uh given the circumstances what can we do it's just what is the only right thing to do and everything else is wrong and uh and then it's like you can't yeah <laughs> unfortunately though you live in the world that has compromise and that sort of thing so it's uh yeah, it, it's sort of, I mean, it's a bit of a, I don't know, like a, 
a fallacy way to look at the world. Uh, mm-hmm. And you, I don't know, you're more effective when you are like engaging with the actual problems, I have to think. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I, I feel like, um, like anarchism for me also was this like really sort of utopian vision, right? Um, yeah. That like very few of us were sort of trying to like practically understand like how right. would we yeah. actually implement it? Like I how... Remember- would it ever yeah. happen here <laughs> when in we the first saw, place? Uh, when we saw the, uh, what, the fucking cancel? Is that the name of that show? Yes. When we saw it live? <laughs> yeah. I remember one of the hosts bringing up that example where he really cared about the practical implication, uh, like implementation of it. And he's like, anarchy sounds great, but like, how do we get sewers to happen? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> but, but most of the other anarchists like weren't, uh, weren't engaging with it in that way. They, they exactly. were taking it, uh, from a different direction and not, not too worried about sewers or all the other <laughs> boring things that make the world turn. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Infrastructure is a bourgeois problem. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Like, <laughs> it's so funny. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's so funny. But I do like, since I was so familiar with that sort of utopian way of thinking, um, I, it's just so easy to see it everywhere. Just little sprinkles of it yeah. here and there, right? Where mm-hmm. like even a recent comment on one of my Instagram pages or posts mm. was, um, someone saying like, oh, you know, we shouldn't, you know, put self-care, you know, in opposition to, you know, the the better, what am I trying to say? The the community needs, right? Like we shouldn't right, put right. like self-care and community needs. Right. It's not one or the other. We should just do both. Let's just and do, do them both. both the right amounts and, <laughs> and no, no limit, no contradiction. <laughs> yeah. Like what's the problem? It's so funny yeah. too, because it's like, like if that were possible, wouldn't we be doing that already? <laughs> like totally, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like it was almost as if this person felt like I was being divisive by pointing out the tension. Um, but it's like yeah. if there were never any conflicts between self-interest mm. and what's better for everybody, we wouldn't need right. We'd a all government. do everything that we need for ourselves <laughs> and everything we need for others all the time because there'd be no yeah totally yeah we need no government no elections mm-hmm. no public policy no laws because everything would just work right <laughs> it's like totally. no, uh, I, I don't yeah. know i feel like the place i see it often is like with uh like climate change stuff i feel like there's a like a large contingent that thinks the only acceptable climate change policy is like an immediate end to all fossil fuel usage right. and projects and uh that any 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 other policy is like a complete and utter failure which is like a wild and like it's just (laughs) i don't know it's just so unattainable like if that's what you consider to be success then your only option is to give up or uh, tilt at windmills forever right like there's no Mm -hmm. it's uh it's, it's not, impossible. <laughs> yeah, it's not going to happen. Well, and I feel like there's something else too for that. Like, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't in like the political stuff you were, but the, the way I relate to it a bit is um, I feel like, I don't know, when I was back in high school, I thought of myself as quite smart. And when something was like popular that I didn't like, the easy answer was that it's because everyone else is stupid right (laughs) yeah and it's like and that was such an easy explanation for so much of the world and i feel like people do a similar thing with politics being like well this you know this company is acting this way because they are evil Mm -hmm. and it's like um i don't know i've really i've really moved away from that line of thinking like i don't know like in high school it's like ah twilight's just dumb and everyone who reads it is dumb for liking it (laughs) and now i'm like well if a book sells that many copies there must be some merit to it and if i'm dismissing it whole cloth then i'm the one missing something yeah Uh, right and and it's like it's I don't know it feels it feels tied in like there's there's some I don't know like ego component to the idea that every organization is compromising where they shouldn't be and where you wouldn't if you had the power but you don't so 
everyone they're just going to keep screwing it up <laughs> and it's yeah. like this, this view of the world where no one else is trying very hard and no one else cares very much and no one else is like thinking it through as well as you are and it's like uh uh i don't know i i couldn't go back to living that way <laughs> i i really think that segues nicely actually into mm -hmm. um then this article we were going to discuss because yeah, yeah. One thing that we've talked about in the past is that, like, there are these, like, massive um, challenges when it comes to content moderation on sites such yes, as YouTube totally. and Facebook, right? Like, YouTube, I can't remember, like, how many hours is uploaded every day, but it's, right. like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's like impossible. Or something like that. It's yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's no way, there's no way that human moderators could watch every hour that's uploaded. So there has to be some type of tool to assist. Right. And, um, I remember Liam, like something you've said before is that you, you feel like, um, journalists that are covering tech in a sort of antagonistic way, sometimes like, deny or downplay the complexity of the problem right they're sort of like yeah, totally. bad people are running <laughs> youtube and they should stop being bad and they should be good instead and then yeah, we wouldn't have a definitely. problem right you take down the videos that are lies and keep up the videos that tell the truth <laughs> exactly like <laughs> yeah, totally. okay yeah so the article we wanted to touch on is called fake taylor swift quotes are being used to spread anti-ukraine propaganda uh, by david gilbert for wired magazine and yeah, it's about like a network of bots on Facebook and Twitter or X that like buy ads to promote their posts. And the post is just like a picture of Taylor Swift or a picture of Oprah or something. And then next to it is just this quote, obviously, that they did not say that is just like opposed to Ukraine. And like, uh, I don't know, quote, like, now, how long will this take? The Ukrainians behave like char charlatans and we continue to pay. Um, that's not right. Yeah. And <laughs> that sounds like Selena Gomez to me. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, a big, a big campaign. That's what the report is about. Um, but I, I don't know how much we want to dwell on the specific campaign that this article was about versus like, cause I feel like this is a story that happens regularly. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, um, these sorts of campaigns are uncovered very often. And um, I have to think that this year is going to be a big one for them because there's like so many huge elections going on all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so what what did you think about an article? Or just to, just to tie it into what you were saying, there is a quote at the bottom where, um, not not the author of the article, but it's a quote from someone they interviewed saying, Meta's sloppy product safety is a security liability for both Europe and the U.S. as we approach next year's elections. And I thought sloppy product safety feels like a, I don't know, a bit loaded, maybe a bit overstating mm -hmm. it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. like that to let this sort of thing through, you have to be sloppy and not that these are hard problems that don't have like easy solutions. Yeah, like perhaps they are actually trying as hard as they can and are always going to fall short because that's like the nature of the task at hand, you know? Totally. Like that there is yeah. an there's an adversary. It's it's like whatever s system they have in place, there is someone in this case, uh the Russian government or Russian military <laughs> who is like actively trying to undermine any system they set up. So it's, it yeah. seems like only natural <laughs> that like I don't know that both sides would evolve and it's like a bit of an arms race and you know sometimes one side will get a bit of a, he a head and then the other side will get a bit of a head and mm -hmm. it's like I don't know is it like a, a current disaster or like the way of the way of things <laughs> yeah absolutely well and it again like the purity or the perfection question right is it's like is there a perfect way to do like content moderation is there yeah, like just that, if we like yeah, care totally. enough and try hard enough, we're going to find a way to like keep all information off of our platforms and everything right. like. Well, and and the key is also keep all of the bad information off the platforms without keeping any good information off the platforms. Exactly. That's what makes it like an impossible 
needle to thread, right? Is that like there's yes. a, you could keep all the bad content off by not allowing anything, right? Right, but as soon as you start letting things <laughs> like you're gonna get a mix yeah well and, and we also like we don't all agree on what is good and what is bad anyway <laughs> that was right one thing. my thought experiment reading this article is like what if taylor swift actually hated the like the support for the ukraine war <laughs> would like right i that post probably should be left up right right like so an people actual know. taylor swift quote Next to okay. Taylor Swift image. Oh my god! <laughs> even if it's like, even if she's been compromised by Russian security or something, or right. like following for propaganda. I uh, have to. I have to me mention you. I'm blaming you for having to mention this, but sure. um, <laughs> yeah, no. The the idea of like if Taylor Swift did say something like in support of right. Russia, like of course, like there would be just such fascinating like stories that would come out of that and different conspiracies and stuff yeah. um, because I just read the most unhinged New York Times opinion piece I have ever read in my life really <laughs> I I cannot believe it got published like it is so funny it's about, that it it's was. about Taylor Swift it is okay <laughs> so it's called look what we made Taylor Swift do it was written by Anna Marks okay. It's like a play on the name of one of her songs. Continue. Yeah. <laughs> and it weaves a completely conspiratorial story about Taylor Swift being a closeted lesbian. Oh, I have heard this as a conspiracy theory. Not it as is. something as the New York Times. <laughs> there is nothing in the entire article that is of any substance. There's like no yeah. like possible ex-girlfriend. There's no ambiguous right. no, no pictures sources. or <laughs> yeah, sources close to her. No, 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 no. It is literally reading into lyrics. It's reading into colors that she likes. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> like the stuff that the wild people on Twitter froth over yeah. right that it's like oh she wore this color and that's the color on this flag so that means this or something it is unhinged it is like <laughs> i could i can't believe it i can't believe that it was in the new york times like it is yeah. it's truly amazing and it really like it it does kind of illuminate like just how completely insane people get about mm. celebrity and yeah. like the stories that they can weave around that so yeah, I don't know. I just had to. I had to say something. Right, totally. That. <laughs> That's funny. I feel like yeah, I should read that. I mean, or should I? It's, you should. I, I it's, want to read it. <laughs> it's so unconvincing. Like it is yeah. so completely unconvincing. It's amazing. Yeah. But this does actually like uh, relate to something else I wanted to mention about this article, which is that like. There is this weird new standard where we expect to know where our celebrities stand on social and political issues. That is true. In right? fact, like researching for this segment, I like tried to figure out if Taylor Swift did have an opinion on you. Right. Because I was like, well, has she said anything? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Turns out no, which I'm OK with because she's a really <laughs> good songwriter. And I don't know how good she is at like world politics uh, foreign policy <laughs> like <laughs> no it's so funny because i'm like the fact that we live in a world where we expect our celebrities to weigh in on stuff that they don't know anything about have nothing to do with and have no yeah. like expertise in that makes the the russian propaganda more plausible totally Right. Like Selena Gomez might say something about yeah. Russia. Well, right. Well, it gets back. I feel like that ties right back to your article about purity. Right. Because the reason people want to hear their celebrity say these things is because they're worried that the celebrity will say the wrong thing. And they want mm -hmm. to like celebrities who say the right things. Right. So it's exactly. like I can only listen to artists who like posted that black square in 2020 or whatever it was. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. And it's like. um yeah, totally. It's it's these like purity tests that people want to put their celebrities through because they don't want to study in a discipline that has black marks on it, a different kind of black mark, and they want to listen to music by people who like, you know, whatever checklist they have for what makes one a pure and proper person worthy yeah. of support, you know? Absolutely. Like, I'm so curious, too, like, is this going to be a drop in the bucket time wise um where 
we do want to know, like we want every corporation to make a statement about Israel, right. Palestine, yeah. right? Cause you know, if you were talking to like, I don't know, a, a 1950s <laughs> toothbrush maker <Yeah. laughs> and you were like, you, you asked for their opinion. Like it, it's just, it's, it would have been absurd back then, totally. right? Because yeah. they make toothbrushes. Like right, this is, right. <laughs> they have nothing to do with, you know, civil rights or whatever, whatever the yeah. issue might've been. So, you know, is it, is it a permanent change that we expect like companies and public figures to like, you know, constantly respond to current events or is it going to like be a passing trend? And in 20, 30, 40 years, we're going to be like, wasn't that hilarious when totally. like, <laughs> yeah. when we got bagel bites to denounce whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I don't know. Cause it's so hard to measure like whether statements like that possibly have any like material effect on. Totally. Well, and again, anything. like the, the weighing the pros and cons, I feel like it does have the negative effect of, people who disagree can point to that sort of thing as like an enforced group think mm -hmm. propaganda style uh, intrusion, right? Like uh, uh, rightly or wrongly, I feel like people do get riled up by that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it would obviously be worth the cost of riling up people with terrible uh, worldviews, <laughs> but I, I don't know, not probably not always like, uh, if it only has a very small marginal positive impact and is like uh, really riles up the the people who will go to vote for the things you don't want, <laughs> like you'd rather they stay home, but they get all riled up because of bagel bites coming out mm -hmm. in favor of something. <laughs> right. Like, <laughs> like it maybe. goes both ways. Right. Yeah, totally. For sure. And like. You know, at, at the time when Black Lives Matter was happening and I didn't yet know they were just going to buy mansions with the donations, um, <laughs> I did I did support that. And, you know, I actually at the beginning was like, oh, wow, like I was getting these emails from various companies that had my email address being like, right. we support this. And and at mm. first I was like, oh, wow, like this is kind of amazing. I haven't seen this before. And, mm -hmm. you know, just to see such widespread, yeah, totally. you know, I've been involved in social movements for a long time and I'd never gotten a company <laughs> email being like, we support you guys. Um, yeah. but then I got kind of suspicious. Cause I was like, wait, like, what is, what, what is this doing? Right. Right. You, this... you supported how? Like, what yeah. are you, <laughs> other than by exactly. sending out an email, what's what's going on here? Right. And like, does this benefit the movement or does it benefit your company? And right. okay. like, you know, yeah. Oh, OK, you love black people. How much do you pay like your yeah, totally. youngest staff, your newest staff, your cleaning staff? Right. Like it's. Yeah. It really is like, oh, wow, it is actually so easy for these companies to say they support this because there are no like actual demands that like, you know, the CEA, CEO like slashes his totally. salary in half and distributes that among his lowest paid employees, for example. Like, you know, there yeah. were no like it was really easy for them to be like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're going to hire this person. They're going to come in and run a workshop. Look, mm. done. We're good. We didn't have to do anything and we're still good. <laughs> totally. We're progressive, right? Like, yeah, yeah. It's strange. Mm. Mm. It is strange. I did. <laughs> I, okay, I did. I did a little fact checking. I was curious, like what? I don't know, because this article did paint a very poor picture of Facebook's like security around this stuff. So I did want to just like check what was the deal with, uh, you know, what does Facebook say about it? Mm -hmm. Um, and they, uh, there was an interesting thing sort of tied into the, how do you determine, uh, what's, what's acceptable, right? Like, you know, is, is Taylor Swift actually saying this stuff is fine. Where do you draw the line? Um, they apparently every quarter they put out an adversarial threat report that goes into detail about like what is going on on their network and what they're trying to uh, prevent and like, you know, how many accounts they took down, which government agencies appear to be perpetrating these threats. Um, and their policy that this stuff breaks is called coordinated inauthentic behavior. Mm -hmm. um, so it's 
in from their point of view, what's wrong with it isn't the content of the messages. Um, it's that uh, the posters are lying about who they are and that they are. Uh, it's like many accounts coordinating and, and uh, promoting each other. Right. Um, but secretly, it's all just one organization. It's not like an organic spread. It's like a fake spread to to increase the visibility of these things. Wow. Uh, which I thought was interesting. The, That's the idea very that the, interesting. The inauthentic <laughs> part of it is the is the thing that makes the difference for like, you know, because they're trying to manage the whole world of Facebook, two billion users or whatever. <laughs> and that's something that they've come up with as like a. I don't know, I guess a universally applicable uh, guideline that they can remove posts when people are pretending to be someone else or, yeah, I don't know, trying to trick people into thinking they are more authoritative than they actually are or thinking that they're from America when they are, in fact, from Russia. <laughs> right. Yeah, the Falun Gong is amazing with that, um, the, mm. uh, the Chinese cult. Um, yeah. They have like some incredibly popular, like mm. conservative American uh, news organizations and like pages on Facebook. Like some of the best followed oh, conservative American pages are yeah. run by the Falun Gong. It's right. It's fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Well, and I feel like those accounts often like 90 percent of the content is reasonable content that reasonable people would consume. And the other 10 percent is like <laughs> just, you know, sneak, sneaking this in there, <laughs> mm -hmm. just like uh, confuse you or or sort of, I don't know, reading the quotes they put on here. It feels a bit like an like an Overton window thing mm. where it's like if you're living in a country where it's like an absurd and obviously uh, illegitimate political belief um, to think that Russia's the on the right side of this war. Uh, it feels like maybe the point of the propaganda is just to be like, to let people think like, oh, well, celebrities are saying this kind of thing. So that means it's an okay thing to say. <laughs> right. You know, yeah. To, yeah. To, to dampen the, uh, <laughs> I don't know. So people aren't like aghast or people think others won't be aghast when, if they start uh, saying that sort of thing. Right. Like I heard once that, um, like the funny thing about pop music is that like we actually often will begin to like something that we've heard many, many times. And mm. so songs that get a lot of play on the radio, like people will start to like them because there's a familiarity to them. Right. And yeah. and that's actually like can be a component of liking something, which I thought was right. super interesting. Um, yeah. And, you know, best-selling books like it's like mm -hmm. bestseller list for example there's like this interesting sort of like reverso thing that happens where like a press will decide to put all of their you know promotional budget behind a book and then mm -hmm. you know through that they will sell a bunch of them to you know book clubs or whatever right. yeah. and then so basically bestsellers are manufactured. There's like a huge kind of, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, like this, this whole network that, that chooses bestsellers. And, and then we see that list and those books were not like individually bought by individual people who totally. wanted to read them. Yeah, right. But just seeing them at the top of the bestseller list makes you think that's probably a good book. <laughs> that's gotta be a good book. I right. I, I'm wading into the murky territory of uh, telling you about a study I read several years ago. Okay. But there was a study about to this effect where I can't remember. It was I think they had three three songs or something like this. None of these details are correct. This is just the vibe I remember. <laughs> it's like they had three songs and a bunch of study subjects, and they all listened to the song and the three songs and like chose their favorite. And um, they manipulated it by uh, telling people which song had been chosen by as the favorite by other people. Right. And uh, no matter which of the three songs they chose, the one that they said this was the one that people liked the best ended up getting the most votes That's as so the best. Funny. <laughs> yeah. It's I'm like sure a you can make a song process. bad enough that it wouldn't win. But it's right. like, yeah, uh, with that sample, at least the uh, the songs were of similar enough quality that people were just like, oh, yeah, that one's probably the best. 
That's so funny. Yeah. And so like if you're just casually scrolling by on Facebook and yeah, you just see, you know, and you might not even read them really closely, but you see, yeah, not these different celebrities that appear to be, yeah, speaking out against Ukraine. Yeah. I see what you mean about that. Just like maybe shifting like what you're amenable to, what you're like willing to consider, because it seems like, you know, either popular or like, you know, people that others look up to feel that way, you know? Yeah, cool. Um, And I did, I looked up one one hard number that this is going to be uh, the mid-episode quiz for you. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> I think it was 2020. Mark Zuckerberg was giving a speech, and he gave a number for how many people worked on security and integrity and that, that sort of thing at Facebook, mm. uh, like a specific number. Uh, and he wasn't that clear, like, if it included contractors. It probably does, but... um. So it's, you know, him trying to be generous, but also it's a publicly traded company, so he can't say outright lies about that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. How many people work on Meta's sloppy product safety? (laughs) Oh, my gosh. The funny thing is I have, like, no sense of, like, how many people even work for Meta. Like totally. What's a lot? What's a little? (laughs) Yeah. yeah, And I'm not even pegging it to anything this time, so it's a shot. Yeah, (laughs) exactly. How did uh, reasonable people answer this question? (laughs) No. Um... (laughs) Let's see, meta security. I'm going to take a wild guess and say 10,000. 35,000. Oh, my gosh. I thought I was guessing high. Wow. But, yeah, it's like a huge portion of their total expenditure is like on people trying to solve this stuff. And I think a, a lot of it, I'm sure some of it is like people trying to solve the like the hard technical algorithmic stuff. I'm sure a lot of it's also poorly paid people who have to look through the posts that get flagged to like train the the machine learning models or whatever. But uh, yeah, yeah, for sure. 30, 35,000 people. So if anyone ever says they're not trying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, try. that's a serious, that's that a serious people, size. That they, don't, they don't come cheap having that many people. I think the other thing too is that like, you know, like I definitely do come across stuff on Instagram or Twitter or wherever where I'm mm. like, huh, like it feels like borderline, like should this be here or not? Um, but I think that most of us have like absolutely no sense of what has been caught by the moderators and what okay. I'm not yeah. seeing, right? right? Yeah. Because it is in orders of magnitude probably much more like horrifying than what I do see where I'm like, right. Oh, I feel kind of offended by that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. The stuff that gets through the filter is bad, but the stuff that doesn't get through the filter, thank God there's a filter there. (laughs) Exactly. Like we have no idea like what those content moderators are having to see every day. Like, (laughs) yeah, yeah. I think I read a story about that once and it's like, it's really bad. Uh, that would be a terrible job. It's a terrible job. Sit at a computer and watch people die on video or whatever it might be uh yeah interesting that almost makes me want to just jump to the ai article because i feel like that's a problem that hopefully ai will help with someday yeah i'm done with that (laughs) we can we can skip ahead to that yeah cool cool uh yeah so there was an op-ed in the new york times written by elizabeth spears um called i finally figured out who chat gpt reminds me of uh here do you know the term reverse headline oh it's a term that i heard a while ago and it like really stuck in my brain and i'm always looking out for them now uh because when i open this article in my web browser the name in the tab like the title there is different Um, interesting so maybe it's like the article that the author wrote and then the editor changed it to that thing i just read but i bet (laughs) <laughs> I bet it's more likely that they do some testing and like if a title, a headline mm-hmm. isn't performing well, then they'll like switch to another one. Totally. Mm-hmm. The, the, the title in the headline uh, explains more. Uh, Chat GPT is an obnoxious toddler and it's up to us to parent it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. I guess, yeah, that if that is the old title, it's like you don't even need to read the article. That's the thing about okay, yeah. a reverse head, a <laughs> traditional headline is like, you know, Joe Biden wins election. A reverse headline is like, you'll never guess who won the election. 
like a, like a normal headline you're like trying to tell the news right but you see them everywhere now the headline that's like uh there is news you can, if you click, you'll find out what it is. <laughs> Sign up to yeah. find out. <laughs> oh, yeah, so it, uh, it's a, an article about um, like generative AI, chat GPT in particular, I guess. And uh, it has a few examples of AI making the sort of mistake that if your kid made the mistake, you'd like see it as a teachable moment and try to teach them to be better about that sort of thing. Like one example was asking an image creator for an image of a very serious person. And every single time it was like an angry old white man. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's serious people of all stripes. <laughs> <laughs> and and similarly asking for a list of gift ideas for boys and girls. Uh, the lists uh, differed and followed some stereotypes like dolls for girls and trucks for boys. And... Uh, yeah, the point of the article was sort of that these generative AI entities need parenting. Um, it doesn't really get into the weeds about how to parent an AI. Uh, and at the very end, it, I feel like it dropped a bit of a bomb that I was like, whoa, that really uh, throws a wrench in the gears. Um, I think where, we noticed the same thing. <laughs> Tell me what you found. Where the author points out, uh, <laughs> look at how viciously we fight over how to socialize real children. Um, which seems like it makes training an AI or parenting an AI a very difficult task because it, I don't know. And then it, it says like, you know, um, we might not be equipped to parent AIs because we're not mature enough ourselves. That's sort how of she ends the article. With, with a, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I feel like it's also a bit, it, it, I feel like she sort of is painting it as if there is an understood way that we should be parenting, mm -hmm. but that maybe we're like not enlightened enough to like implement it, which I, yeah. I don't know. I, I, I mean, we picked articles in part because they tied into your purity article. And mm -hmm. I feel like this really gets at it where it's like, it's like the same thing. It's like you want your celebrities to be pure and your academic studies to be pure and your Facebook feed to be pure and everything that your AI could say to be pure. You don't want to use yeah. an AI that has ever accidentally or on purpose uh, said that you should buy dolls for girls. <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I felt like I felt like she contradicts herself, right? Because she yeah. there's a paragraph where she talks about how like teaching children moral lessons is one thing, but yeah. that actually getting them to act in accordance with those morals is yeah. like a completely different matter, implying, I think, that it is much more mysterious and difficult and unpredictable to to actually convince a child <laughs> to act appropriately. So if you're comparing totally. the two, then doesn't that also apply to AI? Like it's it's her <laughs> metaphor. It's not my metaphor. <laughs> no, it's true. Well, and I, I feel like also it's like it's one I don't know. It's it's just a weird view of like the, the tool that a generative AI is. Cause I feel like it's a bit of a trap to ask it for a list of gift ideas for boys and girls. Right. Exactly. Because I feel like <laughs> what if you asked for kids? Some, it's like <laughs> someone who is uh, worried about gendered gift ideas wouldn't ask it that way. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> exactly. Like I just, I feel like this whole article, like did not make a convincing argument to me mm. because like one of her sort of like gotchas about how devilish the AI is behaving right. is that we got a, a a grumpy man from a very generic prompt, right? Like if you typed in like, I want a picture of a very serious Asian woman, it would give you that. If that's yeah. what you're looking for, it's available. It's not going to be like, Oh, women are never serious, right? Like, no, it's it's literally <laughs> like you you need to give it the information, yeah, to it's totally. produce what you want. Well, and it's a weird, right? it's a weird. It's hard to think of like how, like practically speaking, an AI that wouldn't fall into these traps. Like, I don't know how how all that would work. Like, mm -hmm. like is it supposed to? 
like know all of the sort of identities that exist and when an identity <laughs> isn't specified it needs to proportionally randomized between the existing identities and yeah like, like what that's no weird. it's it's very strange and it's just like not something that concerns me i'm like of all of the problems in the world <laughs> the fact that you got a, a guy it, as a stock image like i just i i i'm really struggling to care about that i'm struggling <laughs> to feel like that matters at all um yeah and i do feel like you know, there, in, at one point she like compares the AI producing an old white man picture mm. um, to a pernicious stereotype. And I'm like, I can't I can't quite make that leap with her. Like, mm. you know, and I'd wait like maybe this is like apples to oranges, but it's like mm. I think that, you know, like our mother's better served by like a particular type of stock photo produced by AI or by like universal right. childcare or wages for <laughs> housework. Like, yeah, and I just, the representation thing, I just got to go off about this for a second. Like <laughs> I understand to an extent, right. That it's like, we don't need white actors to be playing Asians or like other people. Yeah, like there's, you know, and I think there are some really great films that have been made now that we don't have, you know, a kind of monopoly of Hollywood totally. CEOs, yeah you know, saying no one cares about people of color, so no one will come to the movie, so we won't make it. That, mm -hmm. yeah, that's that seems like an obviously good thing overall, generally speaking. But when it comes to the idea that, like, all of us need to, like, be represented and seen, like, I, I got to say, like, as someone mm -hmm. who has, like, tons of bad stick and pokes and, like, weird haircuts, <laughs> I don't get represented. Like, I don't see myself. Right. <laughs> and why would why would anyone put someone with such terrible <laughs> tattoos in a film? Like, it just, it doesn't happen, you know. Actually, sure. there's an exception. Murder at the End of the World, a uh, recent TV show, I had a oh, weird, okay. like, uncanny valley. You felt represented valley. by that one? <laughs> I did. There were, like, these two, like, scrawny, mm. um, slouchy, greasy Redditors. And I was like... Right. I actually look like you guys. This is crazy. <laughs> but anyways, that was the first time. And I, I it was right. cool, but it didn't feel like this incredible moment, like life changing moment where suddenly the yeah. world opened up to me, you know, and I even like I saw a car ad recently where there was like this ambiguous duo is these two women in the car. Right. And one has long hair and one has short hair and a leather jacket. So it's like, Ooh, maybe they're sisters, maybe they're girlfriends, right. you know, like there's like a vaguely butch person. And it's the first mm. time I've seen a vaguely butch person in a car ad. Mm -hmm. And it was just as annoying as every other car ad. <laughs> it's a car ad. Yeah, like totally. <laughs> what are we fighting for exactly? Like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. No, okay. This did. We're gonna wait. We're you know. We probably said some controversial things. We're gonna get. It's gonna get worse. <laughs> <laughs> I've been reading this book uh, called. Oh, I can't remember the order of it. It's called like the kingdom, the glory and the power, in some order by Tim Alberta, <laughs> and it's this book. I picked it up. I saw it like on some year end lists, and um, it's like a book about the evangelical movement in America and sort of how it's gone astray. And I didn't realize when I picked it up that it's written from a very, very Christian perspective. Like the guy is like, like all of his problems with the evangelical movement is like that they are, they've strayed from Jesus. Like that's the problem with it, which from his mm -hmm. perspective, which right. is, it's a fascinating like uh, angle that I didn't expect. And it's, it's fun to like read something from a perspective that I uh, don't hold, uh, which probably reached a pinnacle in the chapter about, uh, abortion uh because i i think he he's not it's not like um it's like mostly a narrative thing like telling the story of him going around uh talking to different pastors and that sort of thing but uh i get the impression he's not a huge fan of uh abortions mm -hmm. uh and it's sort of going through the history of the last few years and gets to the part on roe v wade uh being overturned and and I, it was the most fascinating little bit I've read in a while because we're ta it's this author who like is uh, pro-life or whatever. Um, and he is saying that Roe v. Wade being overturned uh, was a bad thing 
because uh, it was sort of a, a meaningless political victory um, and that the number of abortions didn't like crater afterwards. Like people have generally found ways around it. And um, that in his view, people with his view uh, are focusing way too much on politics and legislation and that sort of thing and focusing way too little on um, adopting children mm-hmm. and uh, providing services for single mothers and mm-hmm. providing food and support and community. Um, and it was just this like, I don't know, this sort of like mind blowing little section where it was like, I don't know, like as someone who <laughs> is so is like really worried about uh, like uh, abortions happening. But the way he's seeing solving that problem isn't reprehensive to me. Mm-hmm. He's like, let's stop abortions by making the world good for every newborn baby. Yeah. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I was blown away by that. It's the only time I've ever put a bookmark in an audio book. I don't know how to access it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's there. <laughs> it's there. But um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It feels tied into this just in that, like, is this the front to fight for gender equality? Exactly. That makes yeah. any sense? Like, is it like, is the is the way to make the world better for underrepresented like people who aren't in, <laughs> I don't know. Like it's it's just a weird um, sideshow. It feels like right, right. To, to want the generative AI bot to not fall for your trap about asking for boy and girl gift lists. Just like put in if you want a picture of a lady, put in lady. It'll give yeah. you a lady. <laughs> like you what do you need? Of, like gender neutral <laughs> child gift ideas. Just ask for that. Like you yeah. can, <laughs> and it's like it's just such a weird, like, um, like side quest to. It's like it, it's it is it feels like it's it is tapping into values that I hold, like equality among the genders matters. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean every pursuit of gender equality is equally worthwhile or equally worth like reading and writing about it's like there's yeah i don't know like I, I i don't see that much direct harm happening from an ai that um does these sort of things i mean no, i guess i could if it was like applied in the wrong contexts or something like mm-hmm. i guess that's the but the then, broader vision right is that why like, doesn't <laughs> she make that case like if there are examples where i would be like oh wow that is really bad i, I wouldn't right. want that to happen why isn't she writing about that because no, what I, she's writing about i cannot i cannot make myself care i think it's because it i don't know i think because it's um i mean it's like imagined at this point the idea right. that like one day ais are going to have full control over the hiring process right and if they have any remaining bias at that point then that will you know ripple out throughout society yeah um, but first of all I, that I don't would be think a problem <laughs> that, that would be a problem i feel like that's a problem the people designing hiring systems are aware of mm-hmm. um and would try to mitigate yeah. And it's also a problem that exists in non AI hiring processes. Like it's not exactly. a an AI novel problem. Like it's it's already a problem. And like solving it in an AI so that in the theoretical future where AI is hiring, the problem doesn't exist anymore. It's like a weird <laughs> I don't know. Like a weird we'll solve this problem with like a new problem, but then we'll solve that problem. And then the problem is solved. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it feels very abstract. And I, I think like I have been harmed by chat GPT. No, I'm kidding. But I do have like a story where I felt like chat GPT was being really like condescending and wouldn't do what I wanted sure. for a yeah. silly reason. So I put in a chapter of my memoir and I can't remember if I wanted it to like pull out the adjectives or like there was something like very mechanical I wanted it to do. Right. Can't remember what it was, but like Mm -hmm. something like that, pull out the adjectives Um, because I'm weird and want to do stuff like that. Um, (laughs) Sure. I mean, fine. 
there's a computer program that can do that now. So why not <laughs> give it a try? <laughs> why not try it? And it kept, it, it was like giving me an error. Like it just wouldn't do it. And I was confused. It, it, it might have even said that I was like going against policy or something like that. And I was like, oh, interesting. I thought you were trying how? to get it to your homework or something. <laughs> yeah. I was like, what is going on? Like, this is like yeah. my original work. I'm looking for a very simple, like, it's like using like a calculator, right? Like I didn't get it. Yeah. So I, what I decided to do is I like chopped it up into smaller sections and I put in the sections like one at a time. And it was like, oh, that section, it completed the task. That section, it completed the task. Oh, this one, it won't. Okay, so the problem, I guess, is in this one. So I chopped it up again. And eventually I realized the reason it wouldn't complete the task was because the word dyke was in in the story, you know. And I was thinking about that. And I was like, you know, obviously the context is not me being like, yeah, oh, I really hate dykes. No, no. The context Mm. was like (laughs) this person that I was on a date with um, and I was describing her. Right. So, yeah, chat GPT like totally could not understand the context of the term and it Mm. totally drew the wrong conclusion that I was like trying to write hate speech or something and it wouldn't complete the task. And I found that kind of like frustrating because I was like, yeah. I don't actually need ChatGPT to like be my nanny. I want it to perform what I want it to. And if it has like this list of bad words that like, no matter, no matter the context, no matter who's writing them, you're just like not allowed to use, like it just, it becomes less useful in like an actual tangible way. Right. Totally. Yeah. Well, and it's, it gets back to like what we were talking about with, um, yeah, with, with Facebook, like trying to remove all of the bad things without removing any good things, right? It's yeah. like this is a good capability that was removed so as to not let bad things happen. And it's like there's totally. there's uh, I there's got to be a balance to be struck, I guess. But um, it doesn't mm. seem obvious to me that the balance is we need to uh, like really lock stuff down and really make sure like priority number one is avoiding gender stereotypes that doesn't mm-hmm. seem like a good priority number one. Uh, it's, I don't know, like it could get bad enough. I, I don't know. Like it's hard, it's hard to, it, they're hard problems. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> the answer is a little more than like parent them good and teach them do unto others and see what have them do unto you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously every parent who feels like they parented well produced the perfect child. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's it's just that never, easy. There's never any other <laughs> yeah. outcome. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, we cracked it with humans. Now we're cracking it with AI. Exactly. Just that. Oh, my gosh. Easy. I am actually <laughs> reading this book about like a psychopathic seven year old right now. Ooh. And uh, it's like one of my favorite, <laughs> favorite types of books is like mm. the evil child. It's often mm. like the child is only evil to the mother but oh, nice right. and to only the in father. private right so it's yeah like, yeah so the mother is like am i going crazy no one believes me that the kid's so evil mm-hmm. it's amazing <laughs> there's like yeah. the one book called <laughs> the push is like that you've got <laughs> you need to talk about kevin yeah, the film classic. with tilda swinton oh my gosh <laughs> so good now i'm just imagining chat gpt just choosing one user and being terrible to them <laughs> <laughs> Just the, the AI version of that, where it's like hey, everyone else says Chad GPT is great, but like it just keeps right. using slurs against me. <laughs> but as soon as someone else is watching, it doesn't anymore. Oh my gosh, <laughs> so good. Yeah. Well, I have no idea how to make a smooth segue, so I'm just gonna talk about the next thing. <laughs> yeah, let's do it. <laughs> um, so. There has been a rather huge kerfuffle at Harvard lately. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's lots of like media out there about it. So I'm just going to give super broad strokes uh, and, you know, people can find good write ups if they're interested. Um, But this will frame the the article I want to talk about. Um, So basically, the president of Harvard recently resigned, Claudine Gay. And, um, there were a number of things that led up to it, like her handling of like uh, Israel-Palestine stuff kind of had already made her a bit of a target. 
Um, but ultimately I think what really did take her down was plagiarism. Um, mm-hmm. so <laughs> these plagiarism, plagiarism allegations emerged and by the time all was said and done, there appear to be 50, nearly 50, five zero incidents Hmm. of misusing academic sources in her work. Hmm. Um, This next part I haven't fact-checked myself, but I heard it on the Fifth Column podcast, so it's their fault if I got it wrong. (laughs) Um, But basically it sounded like what it was is that she took quotes from other people, you know, removed the quote marks, quotation marks, and, and changed it just enough, like, so that it wouldn't be super easy to tell that it was like the same thing. Right. She's like paraphrasing heavily. Mm -hmm. Um, and, but the, the author of that quote might still be cited in the paper. Right. So Hmm. it's like, it's almost like she was trying for plausible deniability where she's like, well, I did cite them at the end. Interesting. But that that is still totally plagiarism. And what makes it obvious that it wasn't just a mistake, like she literally like forgot to put in the quotation marks, is because it was altered. Right? right. If right. it was the totally. exact quote, then maybe the quotation marks got lost somehow. But if she took off the quotation marks and jumbled yeah. up the words, you're like, that's that's not an accident, right? Totally. Yeah. That's, that's the sort of thing you would do if you knew you were doing something wrong and we're trying to hide it. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. So this, I have been kind of fascinated by this because like you really do have a bunch of people who are like totally ignoring well the plagiarism allegations and saying that, you know, she's being persecuted due to her race and her gender because she's a black woman. Right. Um, Which is a fascinating thing to say that like a plagiarist (laughs) Mm. has been found to be in the presidency (laughs) of Harvard University. Um, But if she was white, she wouldn't have to resign over that. Right. Like. Right. I I guess I guess the argument is that people wouldn't have even checked. Mm -hmm. Right. It's that she like has a target on her back for some people because they like see her as part of like some liberal book agenda thing. Right. Which like is arguably true. But if there was no plagiarism to find, (laughs) then she'd still have the job. Right. Like, it's just if you don't plagiarize, you can't get caught plagiarizing. Yeah. (laughs) Um, So it's it is interesting. And you also have people like trying to say this isn't plagiarism, which is also fascinating that like academic leftists would be like defending plagiarism, like obvious plagiarism and many instances. Right. Like not one, right, one yeah. or two, <laughs> like a clear, a clear pattern of yeah. doing it on purpose, like yeah. through her entire academic career. Yeah. Um, Inter- okay. Well, this weirdly ties back to that book I was talking about. <laughs> Go it's for like, it. It's a total thing that happens all through the evangelical church. I'm learning that, um, when people in the church, like high up positions are, uh, accused of something, uh, large portions of the church will often come to their defense, not about what they did exactly, but about you are just targeting this man because he's preaching the word of Jesus Christ. That sort of thing, right? Like there's this anti-religious movement and you're just buying into that. And that's why you say that our pastor is stealing money from the church or whatever it is. And even, even when it becomes clear that he was stealing money from the church, that line of defense continues somehow that it's like they're just trying to take him down like sure he made a couple mistakes but like he's trying to spread the good word and you're you hate that (laughs) and it's yeah yeah, it's this weird uh yeah the author of the book does not care for that sort of thing he thinks jesus wouldn't either (laughs) yeah that's like literally the exact same thing to just like yeah come to someone's defense sort of uh impulsively right because you're like oh anyone who's against this person is against me and is against good. Totally. And, and you know, just to they're... like fit these specific things into like these much broader narratives as if it needs to be like consistent with that, as opposed to like a unique case that needs to be handled as it is. Right. right. That, you know, that it's like not, you know, 
the specifics of this case don't matter because it's part of such a big trend. And it's like, well, oh my gosh, (laughs) (laughs) such a brain dead like take. And it's so common. Like, yeah, it's it's baffling to be like, yeah, the specifics do not matter. We're going to completely generalize about every aspect (laughs) of this and draw our judgment based on that. Like, it's amazing. Um, The one thing I've heard that I'm kind of sympathetic to, um, and I didn't think that I would end up sympathetic to Claudine Gay's situation, but (laughs) some people are saying like, listen, this is actually standard academic practice. You know, there's so much pressure to be productive and constantly publish papers that people do this. And it's sort of like an unwritten rule. Right. Um, right. And I think like, that that could be the case, right? Like it is yeah. true that sometimes you have these perverse incentives that, um, yeah, just get people behaving in a way that, yeah, contradicts the formal rule. So I think time is going to tell with that because there is yeah. like a total, like there is a hunt now basically yeah, for totally. plagiarists. I think I'm pretty sure it ties into our last story in that AI is what's making it possible. I right. think that that's, that's the thing is like before it would have just been, unfeasible they they would check for exact wording being copied but there wasn't like a uh any sort of computer program like a scalable system to be like is this like specifically copying the idea but like rewording it in maybe unexpected ways mm-hmm. but uh computers can do that now we can do that now and computers are really good at that <laughs> at combing over like you know millions and millions of papers and finding all of the instances that are like uh, that fall within some criteria. So yeah, it'll be, I, I'd be curious to see just, uh, yeah, I think, I think we will know, uh, mm-hmm. if this ends up having been a standard practice that, uh, no one talked about, or if this yeah. is like a unique case. I totally agree. I think the next few years are going to, yeah, just blow this open. Like, <laughs> yeah, was she an outlier? Was she doing what everyone else was doing? Um, I don't think Harvard should like keep a plagiarist president just in case. No. Like, <laughs> I mean, you know. it's like they have their <laughs> rule book, right? That they give out to the students. Yeah. And it says don't do that sort of thing. So it's, yeah, yeah if the 18 year olds can't consistent. do it. <laughs> yeah. Like it just, yeah. yeah. So it, it, it's a scandal that really does have it all. You know, you got your lying <laughs> and your cheating, your widespread defensive lying and cheating. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, people saying that that it's all about race. Like it's it's been really interesting, yeah. um, and a real lightning <laughs> rod as well. Totally. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's within all that that whirlwind that mm-hmm. John Schwartz uh, wrote a provocative article for The Intercept called <laughs> "Let's Seize This Opportunity to Destroy Harvard." <laughs> <laughs> and um, the article's main point is that opportunities in America are largely reserved for Ivy League students, like the top opportunities, right? right? Presidency, Supreme Court judges, yeah. um, and I think even if you look at like the journalism industry or publishing mm-hmm. in general. They are largely run by and staffed by people who have Ivy League right. degrees. Time for surprise quiz number two. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, because this article, it did provide the two examples of presidents, which is uh, it's a pretty remarkable streak. I can't remember what it was exactly, but it's like five presidents in a row mm-hmm. were all from the Ivy League. Yeah, and almost and, all of their opponents were also from the Ivy yeah, League. Yeah, right. There was like two chances to not vote for an Ivy League uh, candidate. Uh, and then similar on the Supreme Court, I think it's eight of the nine or something like that uh, were mm-hmm. from the Ivy League. Um, so that's two examples, which is pretty good, um, <laughs> but not good enough for Liam. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to think of like what's another group that is, um, uh, you know, like the wealthy and powerful, right? Like the the pinnacle of American achievement or whatever, influence, that sort of thing. Um, and I thought of the uh, Fortune 500 CEOs. So the Fortune mm-hmm. 500 is the 500 companies in America with the most revenue. And okay. each of them has a CEO. And uh, they went to schools. <laughs> okay, so this is and, like the financial elite, not the academic elite. Yeah, yeah, to, or, mm-hmm. or corporate elite, maybe. Corporate um, elite. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's a better way to put it. Yeah, so... Uh, there's 500 of them. Do you want to take a guess? Uh, how many of them attended one of the, I think it's six Ivy League schools? I don't oh, know if I, what is it? Brown, Harvard, Penn, Yale. 
Mm. Do <laughs> Columbia? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> we don't have IVs in Canada, so. <laughs> no. It's just, did you know it's just a sports league? Yeah. <laughs> yeah it's, it's weird, I, man. It, it has so much prestige, but like it's just they play sports together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, so. Out, so. Five, out of 500. Mm hmm. Okay, yeah. I don't think that car corporate America um, holds Ivy League graduates on the same pedestal as mm. certain other industries, although I'm sure it doesn't hurt. <laughs> well, wait, but you say other industries. It is. Mm -hmm. all, all the big industries are represented in the Fortune 500. Right. It's like any, any okay, not okay. public entity. So it's like your biggest tech companies, your biggest oil companies, your yeah. biggest pharmaceuticals. It's you know, runs the gamut. I mean, the, the five hundred. Yeah, for companies. sure. I just, I would be surprised that there are many journalism organizations or book publishing organizations. Uh, totally. Yes. Yeah. Because those are not like revenue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're they don't particularly make that much money. But anyways, yeah, yeah and not public stuff like government and so on. Yeah. Um, okay, so at corporate. Da, 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 I'm gonna I'm gonna say forty forty percent. I thought your guess was 40 total. Uh, the answer is 56 of oh, 500. Wow. So, so like a scooch over 10%. Okay. It's so I way I overestimated. Think. You did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Which I think I would have too. Um, that's I, th I thought that was almost shockingly different from the number for presidents. I don't know why mm -hmm. they're so different. But uh, yeah, it's like <laughs> it's very different. Um yeah, and I wonder too, like, because I do feel like um, if your aim is to be a CEO mm. versus, yeah, being a judge, um, yeah, yeah, like what sort of industry are you trying to get into? Because CEO, although, yes, like you said, all private corporations have them, um, it's a particular type of job, right? Like it, oh, it involves yeah. certain types of management, certain types of finances, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, although I feel like the most reputable like MBA place to get one is the Harvard Business School. Like they are, yeah, it's not right. like they're not they're not competing in that area. They they do, but uh, yeah, not so much. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it's well. And the other weird part about it is that like presidents at the end of the day are voted for by the citizens mm -hmm. um, in primaries first, and then in the election. Whereas you, CEOs are usually appointed by like boards of very rich people and it's like not right. the public who gets to decide uh in any right it's really removed from any like public scrutiny who gets assigned that sort mm -hmm. of thing which is just you'd think it would go the opposite way right that the rich elites would be you know the person where you only need to get nine friends together and choose the ceo you'd mm -hmm. think that would be uh more sort of centralizing than uh democracy but <laughs> Yeah, well, oh, I think the not. other <laughs> part, though, is like there has been a real um, division in how mm. the wealth, wealthy elite and the educated elite vote, right? Like, yeah, wealthy being totally. like, if you're a rich, if you're super rich, you're going to vote mm. Republican. If you're super educated and you have a PhD in belong and beyond, you're likely to vote right. Democrat. So you do have yeah. like this divergence. Um, but it is, it's very, it's a fascinating, um, so, so yeah, the article is right. sort of saying like, <laughs> let's just smash Harvard, um, all together. Right. Sort of almost like, let's, <laughs> uh, let's not agree with the right wingers who are mad about Harvard being too leftist or whatever, Right. but let's not defend Harvard too hard. And like, maybe if they're <laughs> succeeding at knocking Harvard down, that will be for the best anyway. Yeah. You know, and I think it, it is, um, it's a conversation worth having. Like, mm. first of all, I don't think it's like realistic to be able to like totally. dethrone Harvard. But I think it's like it's a pretty tongue in cheek article. I feel like we should point is. that out. Like it's not a <laughs> it's not seriously talking about like let's actively try to destroy Harvard. It's more yeah, like, like go there with hammers. But yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I guess like he is saying that like um well, I don't know, maybe this would be putting words in his mouth. But the idea is that like students who attend Ivy Leagues are not necessarily like the smartest and most innovated kids. Right. Uh -huh. They are they have been trained to perform in a particular way and yep. they can do that. Um, and so like are those people best equipped to be in charge of like really important institutions? Mm. Um, and I think like this gets at maybe the idea that like the larger question 
is not about affirmative action. It's not about legacy admissions. Mm. It's not about like what color the next president should be. Um, it's like, should, should Harvard exist at all? Should there be like right. this really tiny, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like what percentage of like people get to get schooled at Harvard or at I yeah. Ivy's in general, it's like almost nobody. Right. Oh. Um, and so, so yeah, like, do we have to select like for all of these important positions, like from such a mm. tiny pool? Right. And I think yeah. that's like, that's what is often missing with conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, or affirmative action is that again, like class is just like not really included. Right. Cause like, right. If you mm. actually wanted to create more egalitarian workplaces, um, rather than like having fancy math you do around identity, like you could decide that you are going to hire some people from community colleges. You could decide right. that you're going to like really have a serious on the job training and that you're going mm. to hire people who have like, who show an aptitude and an enthusiasm, but don't yet have exactly the skills you need. Or yeah. another way you could do it is like there are so many jobs that have a bachelor slapped on the requirements mm. <laughs> and it's clear that that is not necessary. The only reason it's on there is to like slim the the number of applications totally. they have to read. Yeah. Right. So like those sorts of changes, like that is how you could really put people on more totally. equal footing. Yeah. And yeah. Or when, the, I, when I think about it, it's also the like flexible work hours. Right, because it's right. like lots That's of people huge. have, you know, people who have kids they need to take care of, um, you know, mm -hmm. might need to finish their workday when school ends so they can go pick up their kids, right? Mm -hmm. Or uh, having childcare facilities at the workplace. Like, there, I don't know. There's so much stuff, uh, yeah, beyond. Um, I don't know. It's, I mean, it gets back to the same sort of thing, right? Where it's like, is this the right uh, venue or the the right approach to solve these problems? Mm -hmm. Um is destroying Harvard <laughs> the solution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it feels like, you know, the massive amounts of attention that are on Harvard is like a distraction from the real issues, like the mm. corporatization of universities. Um, and like, no matter how carefully you tweak admissions, mm. again, almost no one's going there. So, <laughs> yeah. um, it's, it is going to be like only relevant to a very small number of people. And it again, like has to do with like, how do we select the future elite? And like, yeah, that's just not a question. Like, I don't think that making the elite more diverse, like that's not something mm. I really care about. Like I, I'd, I'd way rather like bring the minimum wage up to a living wage, you know, cause totally. DI often just really feels like, you know, how can specific individuals like remove themselves from the working class and make their way out of that um, so that we can have a more diverse elite rather than being like, how do we improve quality of life for whoever's left behind? Whoever is right. like never yeah. in a million years totally. going to these it's... places or getting schooling at all. Right. Yeah. I feel it's almost like... Um like racial disparities are a symptom of the problem, but trying to solve that symptom directly doesn't necessarily address the actual problem, mm -hmm. which is that there are like, it's, <laughs> it's like, it, it's bad when one group of people is suffering disproportionate to other groups. Um, but is the solution to like even that out or to try and address the suffering itself? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. I uh, I recently had a someone message me about an Instagram post I made, and they asked me if I thought that um, therapy was political, and if therapy was revolutionary, if it was you know if it was a marginalized person going to therapy, and hmm. I I was like you know, I think it, it can be beneficial. It can, you know, be helpful. Uh, but I'm not convinced it is a political act. Um, can you explain to me how you see people going to therapy, like changing the material conditions, um, for people's lives in a positive right. way? Cause for, yeah. if you can, 
if if I could be convinced of that, then I might change my mind. Yeah. So it was interesting because the response I got said a number of different things, and it kind of shed some light on the nationality that she is of, which is is not American, and she's mm. talking about people of that nationality in America, and mm. um, that they often work low wage jobs, and some of them even sort of um, it's like a badge of honor to work a dangerous job, right? Um, right. There's like a pride there. So that that I thought was really interesting. But ultimately what she told me was was going to change basically is like if her people have more self-worth, they'll go out and get higher paying jobs. That was mm. like the mechanism. And so I, you know, thanked her for her messages and ended it there because I was like, I don't want right. to get into a huge back and forth. But when I thought about it more, I was like, OK, so self-esteem, basically you're saying Low-income people need more self-esteem. Self-esteem will get them out of poverty. Right. So there's two things mm. that really undermine that as like any type of like <laughs> revolutionary political leftist goal. Um, mm. First of all, we tried that. There was like uh, I read about <laughs> it in the Quick Fix by Jesse Single. Um, there's a chapter on the self-esteem craze, and it really was like, you know, this. Yeah conservative idea that <laughs> what what poor people were missing was character right and and if you could improve their character mm -hmm. they would leave poverty it didn't happen it didn't work and it was actually an excuse to like cut a lot of really important social services um right so that's not that's not how people escape poverty and on the other hand the second point is like even if that does cause people of your nationality to escape poverty there's going to be new people who get those low paying jobs, mm. right. Who become the cleaners and the housekeepers, because that's right. like, that's just how it's going to go. If, if we don't, you know, raise the floor, the fact right. that your people are more successful mm. and wealthier and better integrated doesn't make those jobs any better. Right. So it's, it's hard to understand yeah. like how that would be. It, it could be good for that group for sure. But, but how in general could it like really change? Yeah. yeah I, you I know, like your first point better than your second point. I feel like there, <laughs> I, it does like that. It can happen where people move up. Uh, and I don't know, like where the worst job in Canada is much better than the worst job in other countries because people have sort of as a whole climbed a ladder. Um, um, I don't know though. Like I, mm. <laughs> I don't know. I volunteered with a union with like housekeepers, mm. right? I'm talking about like janitors, housekeepers, like, yeah. uh, maintenance oh, workers. Totally. No, no, like, I don't, I don't yeah. want to say there's no bad jobs left. I, but I do think the worst job is better than it was in the past or is currently in other right. places. But do you think that's because of therapy and no. self-esteem <laughs> or do you think that's because of labor organizing? Well, it's <laughs> I do I think or something uh, else I, mean, I don't think it's self-esteem and I don't no, think it's no, therapy. I wouldn't say it's self-esteem things like education that help people move into higher paying work I think do mm -hmm. lift the whole society to some degree um, right yeah but, yeah. yeah a country <laughs> that has no university like Estonia was like that for a long time mm. and it wasn't until there was a, a university established in the Estonian language that it was possible for Estonians ethnic Estonians to oh. like be have any quality of life yeah, or, or, or even like yeah. uh making a bunch of the population literate makes mm -hmm. people generally able to do uh, higher paid work and helps the whole society yeah uh, i'm not sure we disagree on any of this no, I, just, <laughs> <laughs> I just felt like you were being a little broad being mm. like well just because someone moves up means someone else has to take the bad job it's like i think if enough people can move up then that, you know, it can be like a rising tide lifts all boats sort of thing. I'd like to see you back that up somehow. <laughs> <laughs> can you think of a way I could? I mean, <laughs> I guess it's like, I, I think it is. I think it's through raising the, the floor, raising like the minimum wage, for example, putting mm. in a minimum wage, right? Like, yeah, those I, types I mean, of actions yeah. can help like the the people at the bottom. I don't necessarily oh. like the whole trickle down. <laughs> no, no, I'm not trying to say like a trickle down thing more. Just um, I think it's I don't know. 
<laughs> we're like, <laughs> what are we, an hour and a half in? <laughs> um, <laughs> no, but there is like like societies where more people can do more productive work where, for instance, people are, um, I don't know, like people are... <laughs> Like, like there's a total amount of goods and services produced by a society. And if society can produce more, um, as long as they're not, you know, that's, I feel like that's the, the two parts of it, right? Is you got to produce more and you got to distribute what is produced in a fair way. Mm-hmm. Um, and people moving to higher paid jobs can be part of the producing more side of that. Right. Um, yeah. needs to be balanced with that things getting equally distributed part. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's no, all I'm trying sure. to push back, though. All right, all right. <laughs> but I just, no, but yeah. self-esteem, it's like, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I'm sure there are individuals who um, have some hang-up that's keeping them back, that therapy helps them break through and they get higher-paid jobs, but I mm-hmm. don't see that as like a scalable solution to poverty. That seems like a one-off or very few... I don't know. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's not not a not a solution to this problem. It's not reliable in any way. And it's just not comparable to to something like labor organizing or yeah, ver- right. various mechanisms that like really do like change things. And yeah, I guess the, real the other... like, practical things. Like yeah. I feel like I feel like maybe we we just like agree, <laughs> right? Like practical things mm-hmm. like like labor organizing or like education or, yeah, or infrastructure. Access access to books, right? Yeah. yeah. Infrastructure, bridges, safe roads. Like it's all, it's all a great mix that helps society <laughs> get better. <laughs> um, yeah. Can, can include therapy, but um, I, I think therapy would probably not make the top 10 list of uh, stuff that makes people's, makes society's life better across the system. <laughs> <laughs> so you have not been persuaded that therapy is revolutionary. Uh, no, that seems like an absurd uh, two terms to put next to each other. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know. I maybe it's, better read essay about that sometime. But uh, yeah, it's a common thought among the social yeah. justice crowd for sure. That's yeah, but only if you're like sufficiently impressed. Uh, okay, you know? it's like if it's revolutionary for someone who like, whoa, they're getting therapy. That kind of person is in therapy. That makes it revolutionary. (laughs) I mean, it's, I think more what it is, is like, you'll hear people say that oppressed people have no choice, but to be political and everything they do is political. So like a black person Mm. taking a nap, that's political. A white person taking a nap, that is not political. (laughs) This is like serious discourse. (laughs) Uh, well, maybe that'll be your next Cure Here essay, and then our next episode we can get into it. <laughs> I would love to get into that. That sounds great. <laughs> well, if anyone is listening and also wants Cure to get into that, uh, send them a message. Uh, yes. little, little pushes here and there. It's talking about something juicy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, definitely let us know. Cool. Well, this has been Hot Take Think Tank. Until next time.